So I'm really delighted to introduce Sonka Johnson, uh, who is uh, at Duke University. And he's had really a fascinating and productive, rich portfolio of, of studies uh, on very diverse organisms, cephalopods, whales, fish, turtles. But more importantly, the major theme of his work has been the perception of the environment and the interpretation of the environment and the development of strategies to deal with the environment. And, and sometimes it involves very elaborate and specific mechanisms. Other times it's really thinking about how organisms see their environment and perceive it. And he's worked mostly on light, but he's also worked on magnetic uh, uh, perception in fish and also turtles. Um, he was also this past summer, some of you might have seen his name in the newspaper because he was part of an expedition that went in the Caribbean and uh, used uh, Edith Witter's uh, really wonderful uh, jellyfish light trip to, uh, to, to video capture a giant squid. Uh, and if you think that's easy, uh, I can tell you about a good friend of mine from the Smithsonian who spent millions of dollars failing to find the giant squid in two big ex expeditions and, and Witter did it and uh, and 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 uh, there's been a couple of expeditions uh, that uh, Sanka was one of, one of a part of one of them. Um, he's also he's the author of a large number of publications, but also two very well uh, regarded texts on light and nature in nature and and visual ecology. Um, so a little bit about his his uh, his uh, background. He uh, he attended Swarthmore College, um, and if you're interested in the backstory of a scientist. I encourage you, not this moment, but later, to Google Sonka Johnson and Swarthmore, and you'll find one of the most interesting uh, and uh, backwards and uh, sideways uh, backstories of how someone becomes a scientist. Uh, he got his PhD in Chapel Hill, working with uh, mm -hmm. William Keir. Uh, then he had a, post a postdoc at Harbor Branch with Edith Witter, and that collaboration has persisted for many years. And then he had a collaboration at, uh, and a postdoc at Huey with Larry Madden. And then he wound up at Duke uh, in 2001, rose through the ranks, and became a full professor in 2012. And without any further ado, the title of the seminar is right there on the screen. So, Sonko, we're very happy to have you here today. Hello. Okay. Am I um, unmuted? Yes. Okay. Good. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Sonka. Um, thanks, Jeff, for such a kind introduction, and thanks all of you for having me here and, you know, in the virtual form. Um, so as Jeff said, um, my work sort of grew out of my background. I was actually originally a math and art major, um, and then ended up, believe it or not, as a kindergarten teacher and a computer programmer and a carpenter and a whole lot of other things that eventually through sort of strange circuitous route ended up putting me as a biology professor. Um, but because of that background in art, particularly in photography, um, I've always been interested in biological topics that involve light. Um, so I've looked at things like transparent animals, bioluminescent animals, animals with all sorts of different colorations, um, how animals look to weird non-human visual systems like polarization vision, UV vision, um, and also how they change their skins and bodies um, to do all these various tricks and how they change their actual eyes um, to let them see in all sorts of different environments, uh, particularly the deep sea. So normally, you know, when I give a talk, I try to present like, you know, maybe like three different stories, sort of a smorgasbord of like, you know, things that, you know, we've worked on over the years, but I figured for Zoom, it might work better to sort of laser in on just one particular thing. And what I like to laser in on are what we call ultra black fish. Um, and this screen is intentionally dark. If you look carefully, you can just sort of just make out these, um, these two deep sea dragonfish here with their long, creepy bioluminescent lures and their exceptionally creepy faces. Um, these guys um, are part of a really wonderful group of animals. One of their interesting characteristics is that they're extremely black. Um, and we sort of came upon this whole project from a, um, an art point of view. Um, a colleague and I, Karen Osborne at the Smithsonian Museum, always like to photograph the animals. We use them for PR purposes, we use them for conservation, a number of other things because we're out there seeing animals that other people don't. Um, and we simply could not photograph these fish. This sort of large group of um, deep sea fish were so black that every time you'd photograph them, it basically looked like a Photoshop mistake. 
or you'd have to overexpose the camera to the point where everything looked terrible. And so in the kind of like making lemonade out of lemons things, we started to become interested in, you know, why these animals are so black. Um, and this is part of sort of a larger project in the lab. We're really interested in the coloration of animals as a function of depth in the open ocean. When you look at the coloration of animals, um, let's say on a coral reef or on land, it's exceedingly complicated. And it's sort of mediated by a number of different processes. Um, you know, you have sexual selection, you have natural selection, you have warning coloration, you have a whole lot of different things going on. But in the ocean, you tend to follow this pretty simple scheme divided up by depth. Near the surface, the animals are very sort of a dark blue over their entire bodies. As you go a little below the surface, their dorsal surfaces are dark blue to black, while their sides are lighter blue and become silvery as you go to their, their ventral surface. Um, but some of the other animals are transparent. As you go deeper, you see more and more transparent animals with their opaque parts being often red and then go even deeper and the vertebrates, typically the fish tend to be black um, and the invertebrates tend to be a deep, deep scarlet red. And then when you get to the very bottom, you get these sort of cream to orange colored um, sort of animals. And unlike in many other places, most of what seems to be driving this in the open ocean is predation. Um, predation in the open ocean is special in a number of ways, none of which are particularly special for the animals being preyed upon. Um, for one, predation is three-dimensional. So there aren't many places in the world where, except the open ocean, where something can more or less rise up from below you and eat you. you know, none of you at this moment sitting in your chairs are terribly worried that like a lion is gonna crawl up from under the floor and eat you. Even if you were out you know, in the Serengeti Plain, you wouldn't worry about a lion coming out of the floor and eating you. Um, there's also um, very few places to hide. There's nowhere really to go. Everything just looks like water. Um, and in addition, predation can often be more total. Um, so when you see, you know, those classic sort of animal shows with the lions again on the little knoll and the Serengeti looking down at the antelopes, they never go down and eat the entire antelope herd. They always pick off, you know, the sick, the sick and the old and so on. Um, they don't go in and like wipe the whole thing out. Whereas if you see a group of predatory fish, sharks, whatever, you know, come upon like a giant bait ball of maybe 10,000 fish in the open ocean, they'll spend the time to eat the whole thing down to nothing. Um, I also like to say, which this picture really exemplifies, that the open ocean is the only place where you can be eaten by birds and sharks at the same time. So this got us interested in a number of different things in the coloration and also the eyes. Um, and one of the classic things about eyes as you go deeper in the ocean is that they become bigger. Um, and the idea is that, you know, there's less light to see, so you need bigger eyes to see by, sort of like owls have. Um, and we're curious really, you know, how much this helps, you know, as part of, you know, this sort of hide and seek game between the predators and the prey in this increasingly dark ocean. And you can see here a number of these animals with really kind of shockingly big eyes. And we used um, cephalopods, um, in particular squid, as a study system. Um, this is data from a host of different um, deep sea cephalopods arranged by their average depth in the ocean. Um, don't worry too much about the colors of the dot. That's um, looking at sort of their investment in, how, in their eyes, you know, how big their eyes are relative to their body size. Um, but do look at the, you know, sort of the size of the eyes of the spots, because that tells you about how big you know, the eyes are. And you can see that for a time at sort of medium depths, they get pretty large. And at the, highest and lowest depths, they're relatively small. But the thing to really look at here in this graph, the only thing really to take away from it is the x-axis. This is the sighting distance, how far away they can see something under normal you know, ambient illumination as a function of their own body size. So if that number is one and you're six feet tall, then you can see something six feet away. What you can see is that by the time you get to about 500 meters down, which isn't even very deep in the ocean, you're already down only to being able to see things that are one body length of yourself away. And as you go deeper, it gets just ridiculously small down to like 0.01% of your body size. And so just trying to see things in the ocean, no matter how big your eyes are, doesn't really work. And just for fun, we calculated how big an eye would have to be at a thousand meters depth, which again is not that deep in the ocean, to be able to see as well as near the surface, if you had like a human size eye and the eye has to be a kilometer across. Um, so there's really no hope if you're just using the ambient illumination. 
However, if you use bioluminescence, this is the same data, but now looking as at targets that actually glow from bioluminescence. So not even glowing that terribly brightly, just growing, glowing as brightly as bioluminescence usually does. And you can see that now, you know, regardless of depth, because these animals are making their own light, um, you can see things about 10 to 100 body lengths away, which is quite good, which allows you to go around, you know, be a predator. So basically, as you go deeper in the ocean, especially when you cross about the 500 meter line, the world goes from being one lit by the ambient illumination to one being lit by various, you know, bioluminescent sources. The one I really want to talk about today is one of my favorite bioluminescent sources, which are flashlights. Um, there are a number of predatory animals in the deep, particularly predatory fish, that will have a bioluminescent source right under their eyeball, um, typically blue, and they'll aim it for like a flashlight to go look for prey. Um, and because they're looking around at open water, um, basically there's no reflectance from that water itself. You know, the light, if you send the light out into the water, it's just gonna sort of go forever, which is very different from if you were shining a flashlight, let's say around a room where it's always bouncing off the wall. Um, so if any light comes back at all, even a tiny, tiny amount, that tells the predator that something is there. And so the assumption might be that the animals that are trying to hide from these flashlights need to be extraordinarily black. Um, they can't just be clear. Um, for example, if you shine a flashlight at night on a window, you get a reflection back. And so just being clear isn't good enough. And we know that transparent animals, when they go to greater depths, actually start to become pigmented. You really need to suck up all the light that's there. Um, the other animals that have to worry about being ultra black, paradoxically, are predators that use light to lure animals in. Um, this is a deep sea anglerfish. Um, and it's got a nice little lure sticking right above its mouth. Um, this lure would work, you know, really well unless the lure also happens to light up the predator itself, because then nobody's going to sneak up and try to bite on, you know, this tiny little glowing lure if it sees a more or less a giant mouth and a body right behind it. So these animals, in addition, even though they're predators, also need to be extremely black. So we first wanted to look to see, you know, how black just just sort of random inverts um, were out in the ocean. Um, and by black, I mean black in the blue portion of the spectrum, um, not black overall, because as you can see, a number of these animals are red, but red animals are actually very dark in the blue. And we wanted to compare this to benthic animals at similar depths in the ocean. Um, and we came up with predictions for how much light these animals would have to reflect whether they were a pelagic animal, meaning they were in the water column compared to a benthic animal that was sitting on the bottom. Um, and if they were trying to hide under ambient light, um, the animals in the pelagic would have to have reflectances between about 30 and 60% over the range of blue light, which is between about 400 and 500 nanometers wavelength. And in the benthic species, it depended on the substrate. You know, They would have to match their substrate pretty well. Um, we used a submersible from Harbor Branch, um, the Johnson Sea Link submersible, to actually go down and get these animals. Um, this thing looks really big. It's about the size of a school bus. Um, when you're actually inside it, though, it's really very tight. Um, here you are, or here I am, actually, in the back of the submersible um, with the um, co-pilot. Um, through that tiny little dark circle in the middle are the, um, the front pilot and the front observer. Um, the co-pilot's entire job on this whole dive is to basically sit there and wait to see if the people in the front have a catastrophic accident. If they do, then he pulls a lever right above his head and rises us to the surface so the two of us will survive. Um, otherwise, more or less, he'll sit there um, reading a book, which is what he's doing now, or argue politics. Um, and it's a tight fit, so I always try to get people in the lab that are really good at diplomacy. Um, so once we bring the animals up, um, we use a system where we send a, basically light through a fiber optic cable. It reflects off the animal. Some of that light is collected back through another fiber optic cable wrapped around the other one to a spectrometer that measures how much light there is of each different color. Um, this stuff's wonderfully portable now. It used to be a real pain to work with this sort of material. Um, but now we have these tiny little spectrometers. They're about the size of a fat credit card. We have these fiber optic cables that are easy to use, these light sources, the PX2 in the lower left there. They're all wonderfully compact, easy to use, and not too expensive. 
And so what used to take half a room to work with, we can now sort of Velcro to the back of a laptop and we're ready to go. Um, so here you see the reflectance measurements from the pelagic species. And you can see that some of them are really, really low. They're basically scraping the bottom of the graph. Um, the average is around a couple percent, but some of them are really low when you're looking this 400 to 500 nanometer blue range, which is the only range that really matters at depth because the deep sea is blue. And if you look at it in a logarithmic plot, two things come out. One is the lower values are extremely noisy, which I'll get to later. They're also very low. Um, they're below about 1% um, of the light coming back, which is extremely low. I mean, your average thing that you think is really black is reflecting about five to 10% of the light. So these are really low, but the measurements aren't great, which again, we're gonna get to in a moment. Um, and so if you look at what these animals look like, if you think about them viewed against just the background light that's down there, a little bit of sunlight that's left, um, this shows that their contrast is negative one, which means that they, basically look like a black object and they could not have a higher contrast against the background if they tried. Um, and so they're not trying to hide against background light. Um, and if we look at what they're really trying to hide against, we created this little histogram here where we're looking at, you know, the minimal reflectance of, you know, where the animal has the least amount of light coming back. You see it's sort of in this, again, the 400 to 500 range and compared that to the the spectral peaks of the bioluminescence that the searchlights were emitting. And then visual pigment maxima basically means what part of the spectrum the predatory fish that are looking at these animals are most sensitive to. And then attenuation distance is a graph of how clear the water is as a function of wavelength, how much light can get through. And you can see that, you know, in this sort of 400 to 500, particularly 450 to 500, there's kind of this zone of death where the searchlights are putting out their light the animals are most sensitive to it and the water's the clearest, meaning the searchlight can go the furthest. And that's exactly where these animals are, you know, the darkest. Um, and then if you look at the benthic species, their reflection, reflectance is much higher and actually gives them a decent match for the background, but I don't wanna talk about that because I wanted to actually jump back to these really dark fish. Um, because the fish are the ones that really stuck out. You know, the, the invertebrates like the shrimp and all that, they were pretty dark in, you know, the um, blue part of the spectrum, but there were some fish that were just really low. And we wanted to sort of figure out more about how dark they really were and how they were doing it. Um, and the first thing we ran into when we tried to measure how dark these animals were and what this upper left-hand graph here is, is a map of the reflectance in percent, so what percent of light got reflected as a function of wavelength. And you can see that basically it's zero, which means that the measurement is worthless. And we tried, I mean, we had probably about four different cruises. Um, Katie Thomas and I, she was a grad student of mine at the time, go out again and again and again and try to measure. And all we could get was noise. And we ended up solving this problem in sort of a technical way, which is in the lower right here, um, normally, when you measure reflectance, you compare it to something that's white as your standard. And it turns out if you do that, um, to make that work, you end up not having, basically everything sort of crams around zero when you're dealing with something black. You can't get an accurate measurement. Um, you don't have what's called the dynamic range. And so we had to actually start with a standard that was jet black to begin with. It only reflected 2% of the light and that allowed us to recalibrate the whole system and get much more accurate measures of what the reflectance really was. And we found that they were just astonishingly low. And so the y-axis here is in percent. So 0.05 means 0.05%, which means only one out of every 2000 photons that hits this animal are coming back. Um, and so that's one astonishing thing. This is actually the blackest known substance on earth. Um, the second is that even though the reflectance over this whole range is astonishingly low, the animals are still optimizing the reflectance to be lowest in the range where these searchlights are in the 400 to 500 nanometer range where there's blue light. They, there is still selection acting to create a system where even the, every part of this range is very, very dark, much darker than anything you will ever see in your normal life they're still working to make it as dark as possible in the blue range, which kind of blew us away. Um, we looked at a number of different species. Um, here you can just sort of see them on a tree and then also you see them 
ranked by the reflectance. A couple of them have reflectances as high as about half a percent, which is still darker than anything you'll probably ever see in your life. And then they go all the way down, you know, to these very, very low numbers. Um, and this is to sort of compare this against, you know, objects in your own experience. It's important to note that this is a logarithmic y-axis again. And so, you know, these things change very rapidly. Um, your average, you know, what you consider really black objects are between about one to 10% reflectance. You know, you might think of them as just really, really dark things, but compared to these things, they're not. Um, the blackest known artificial substance is called Banta black, which I'll show you in a moment. And this pretty much matches the darkest fish um, that we were able to measure. Um, to give you an idea of just how dark Banta black is and why we're having such a trouble photographing these fish, on the left, you see a bust of, I'm not sure who that is, but the right, it's the same bust, uh, but coated with Banta black. And you can see that now it just looks like a Photoshop mistake. All three-dimensional details of this, um, this sculpture are completely gone um, when you have something that has a reflectance this low. Uh, another example here, this is a bowl. It's a large sort of, think of it like a salad mixing bowl um, with the concave side facing you. It is not actually a, like a circle, a flat circle. This is a completely curved thing. And you can see again, because the reflectance is so low, um, not only is, you know, is it completely black and looks like a mistake, but all three-dimensional detail is gone. Um, so these fish really are extraordinarily black. So how do they do it? Um, we know that just piling on more and more pigment will not do it. You can't make something blacker and blacker just by putting more and more black paint on it. Um, for example, here, this is a, a sort of a, I don't know, some kind of wood lacquered table. Um, with tons and tons of black paint on it. Um, but the surface um, still reflects a fair bit of light, the way you get glare off lots of things, lots of shiny things. Um, you can see that the top surface doesn't really look that dark at all. Um, this is why like early attempts at making things really black usually involve something like felt um, or um, velvet or something like that, because it's not a smooth surface. And that seems to be the trick that all these animals are playing in different ways. And the way to think of this is it's not enough just to absorb light because if you do that, then some light just kind of bounces off the top. What you need to do is create sort of a sponge of an absorbing substance so that when light goes in, it can't immediately come out. It just has to keep bouncing around, bouncing you know, from thing to thing to thing. And every time it bounces into another absorbing thing, it loses a little bit more light. And that's what velvet does. Um, and that's what this Vanta black does. It's actually a little forest of carbon nanotubes all aimed vertically so that when light goes in, it just keeps bouncing off these carbon nanotubes and eventually there's no light left to come back out. And so that's sort of the basic kind of principle we're looking at. Um, because the deep sea is hard to get to, um, we first did this actually um, looking at ultra black butterflies. They're another group that have extraordinarily black surfaces on par with these deep sea fish. And we found that they have these very complicated um, structures on their scales. Um, and we did a paper where we looked at, you know, sort of the optical modeling of how this complex structure of scales lets light go in and then lets it bounce around and bounce around and bounce around and eventually nothing can come back out. Um, but when we looked at the deep sea fish, they didn't really have a very complicated structure like the butterflies did. The butterfly structure was really exquisite. Instead, we found a, a whole number of these pigment granules these little things made of melanin, the same thing that you know can make our skin dark or make our hair dark. Um, and they had a very specific size and they had a very specific shape. They looked kind of like little tiny Tic Tacs for those of you who've ever eaten Tic Tacs, um, but of a very particular size. And they were all in this like big layer in the middle, sort of different from your average fish. And so we were curious if that could pretty much explain the story. Um, but to kind of give you an intuitive sense of what's going on before we delve into a little more deeply, think about when you walk on the beach, which you know I think luckily you guys get to do because you're on Long Island. At some point you've gotten to walk along a sandy beach. You've known that when you walk on wet sand, that when you step on the sand, your white, a whiter area will appear around it, sort of a lighter part of sand. And why is that? Um, it's kind of cool. This was worked out by Craig Boren, oh, I don't know, probably 10, 20 years ago. So when you have wet sand, um, 
you have all these particles of sand, these little blue triangles, and the refractive index difference between the sand and the particles is relatively low. And there's an optical property when that happens, which means that when things are scattered by the sand, when light is scattered by the sand, it's mostly scattered in a fairly forward direction. It doesn't change the direction of light much. And so when you have a beam of light, you know, these red arrows here come in, every time it hits a piece of sand, it just sort of changes direction a little bit. And so it takes a long time for it to come out. Every time it hits a piece of sand, a little bit of it's also absorbed. And so wet sand is fairly dark. This is the same reason that wet clothing is dark. Um, it's the reason that most things when they get wet, get darker because the light's having, taking a longer time to get back out. And over that time, light has had a chance to be absorbed by different things within the material. If you have dry sand, and when you step on sand, you push away the water to make it drier, you get a larger refractive index because now there's you know, some air and such in between um, the particles. So there's a larger refractive index. And so light gets bounced sort of more severely and can come back out more quickly. And so it has less chance to be absorbed and it looks lighter. And that's why dry objects are typically brighter than wet objects. If you're thinking about these deep sea fish, they have to do something kind of similar. If you look on the left here, the problem with deep sea fish is that underneath all these little pigment granules is actually a pretty white surface. It's a lot of connective tissue um, that reflects a fair bit of light. And so if the light goes in and it doesn't bounce around much, it will hit this white surface at the bottom, come back out, and it'll still be a pretty not very black fish. However, if the light goes in, sort of showing here on the right, and it bounces around more inside this layer of pigment granules, meaning that in addition to being absorbed, it's really bounced around a lot, then it has more chances to be absorbed um, before it gets to the bottom, or maybe it never even gets to the bottom, and before it gets back out, and it'll be a lot darker. And so what we wanted to know are, are these little melanin granules, are they the right size and the right shape to maximize the amount of time that the light spends inside this layer so that the tissue will end up being extremely dark? Um, the problem with this, though, is that melanin turns out to be one of the more freaky substances in the entire biological world. In addition to having a very high real refractive index, um, it's not as high as diamond, but it's very high, which means that it scatters light really, really strongly. It also has a high, what we call imaginary index, which is another way of saying it absorbs light really strongly. And because of that, you sort of violate all the rules that make doing this sort of modeling to figure out what's going on very hard. If you think of, and you know, you have to be kind of like a real optics nerd to care about this part. But if you think about like the angels and the devils of optical modeling world, in the best possible world, you're modeling really tiny little particles that are really loosely packed with a low refractive index and a low amount of absorption, um, which a good description of that would be like modeling like little particles in the ocean of like phytoplankton or something like that. Um, but if you're dealing with larger particles that are really crammed in like these are that have this high refractive index and absorb light really strongly, then it's really, really hard to do. And we spent actually a couple of years trying to figure out the best way to do this. We stole actually an idea from NASA who worked out the same thing to understand why the moon, why the full moon is so much brighter than it should be. It turns out the full moon is 10 times brighter than a half moon instead of twice as bright like you would think. And that's because it acts kind of like a retroreflector like on your bicycle. And they developed a nice set of math and such that allows you to model something that's strongly absorptive and really packed together and scatters a lot of light. And I won't go into the details of it, but when we used it, we're able to, you know, you get these sort of weird looking graphs. And the only thing I want you to get from this, because we're going to jump from this in a moment, is that the size of the actual particles, which are shown here in this sort of light blue, blue on the graph between about 250 and 550 nanometers in diameter, that's the range where you get a whole bunch of scattering and a whole bunch of scattering to the side. Um, and so it has to, the light will stay in this layer a long time before it can get back out, which will make you a really, really ultra black fish. Um, but we didn't like it that much. So we switched to a different method that was more um, suited to what we wanted to do. And the graph on the left is sort of like this last piece here of this puzzle. And it's showing, if you look at, you know, the size of these particles, 
um, which is the y-axis, their diameter, and then the x-axis called aspect ratio. It's basically how elongated these different tic tacs are. You know, if it's one, then they're basically a sphere. If it's four, they're really pretty elongated. And then it's showing you how much light comes back. And you can see there's this area in the middle where the particles have a diameter of about 500 to 1,000 nanometers and have an aspect ratio of about two to three, which means they're about two times, two to three times longer than they are wide. And then the white, big white dots are showing where the, you know, the ultra black fish were. And you can see that they sort of fall into this pocket, but the little triangles are sizes and aspect ratios of melanin particles from a whole bunch of other um, vertebrates, uh, mostly um, reptiles, amphibians, and fish um, that aren't ultra black. And you can see that they fall outside this range. And it's important to note that, again, the graph on the y-axis is um, it's um, logarithmic. And so these differences are actually a lot bigger than they look. Um, the graphs on the right are basically just showing you know, the actual measurements we took using violin plots of you know, the aspect ratio and the, um, the diameter of these particles. Um, the very last thing we wanted to do, this is the last slide here, is look at, well, how much does this ultra black really help you? How much does it help you, know, you hide in the ocean from these other fish that are going around with flashlights? And so if you imagine like that the distance that one of these flashlight fish can see you is one, like, like let's call it like one meter away, because you have a reflectance of 2%, which is more normal, then as you go down to lower and lower reflectances, um, all the way down to zero, which isn't totally possible, but you can see you know, that they're getting close to it. Um, that's what the gray dots are, the measurements from the actual black fish that you know, we measured. Um, you can see that they're able to cut the distance at which they can be seen by a predator by half or even more by like a factor of four, and in the best one by about a factor of five to six. And so it really does help them a fair bit. Um, and with that, um, I'd like to thank um, various folks that have funded us for this work over the years, um, primarily Noah. Um, thank um, Alex Davis, who works with me on this, Katie Thomas, and um, Karen Osborne. And thank you for listening. And I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, you're muted. I'm not muted anymore. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. Uh, okay. Uh, so everybody, uh, we could have catch as catch can sing out and ask a question, and let's see what happens. Is that okay with everybody? Should I stop sharing? No, I would. Uh, that picture is kind of cute, but um, I All don't. Right, know. I'll leave it up. You can leave that on. That's fine. Well, All right. Super interesting. <laughs> um, I was wondering, I had a question about, um, so you talked about the connective tissue being white and reflecting mm -hmm. back off and then, then having to sort of deal with that. Has there been any evidence that you know of of adaptations for darker connective tissue? Not that we've seen. Um, so, you know, we do a lot of these trips and we do a lot of trawling. And so, you know, sometimes, you know, these fish can come up a little bit damaged from the net and so on. And so we very often get to see, you know, underneath the upper layer. Um, and in general, we're talking about pretty white tissue underneath um, of these fish. Um, it'd be interesting, though. I mean, to do it, they would have to add some sort of a, probably add some sort of a pigment. Um, now, some of them, you know, they don't reflect as strongly because the connective tissue layer isn't terribly thick. Um, and so then you sort of vanish into the muscle and so on, which can be considerably more transparent. You know, some of these animals, you know, they have a dark surface and then the inside is more translucent. Um, but the ones that are tougher and have more connective tissue and have like real layers, um, those are really white once you get underneath this, um, this black layer. So the neat thing is that they're able to absorb, you know, like almost all the light over a distance of, you know, not many microns, um, you know, so they can, you know, get rid of things very quickly uh, before they hit that white layer underneath. Yeah, that's super interesting. So how, um, this is Josie, I have a question. How, um, these are really deep water organisms. How far up in the water column do you find 
organisms that use this kind of strategy for avoiding. Oh, it's how far up do you find like really dark stuff? Yeah. Um, we're talking like daytime depths because you know some of them vertically migrate. Oh, so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if you're talking about daytime depths, I mean, in my experience, and it's a really rough rule, and I'm talking about open ocean where you know you can sort of where the optical properties are pretty constant, so you can say that you know your depths are comparable. Things seem to switch over to about 500 meters. You know, there's kind of like an upper mesopelagic and a lower mesopelagic. Mm -hmm. So we call the mesopelagic, you know, the twilight zone between yeah. 200 and 1,000 meters. Yeah. And that upper part, there's still enough ambient light to live by it. So, you know, at 200 meters in open ocean, like if you're in the Bahamas and it's sunny out, it's like a room. Um, I mean, I've been down in a submersible 200 meters and it's like looking around oh, yeah. a fairly well lit room. Yeah. Um, by the time you get to 500 meters, it's like looking around at very late twilight. You know, for us, it's pretty, you can still kind of make things out, but it's hard, um, especially if you're not looking up. But from 500 to 1,000, I mean, yeah, you know, with, with a dark adapted human eye looking straight up, if there's something blocking, like let's say the instrument bar of the submersible, you can kind of make out that it's silhouetted, um, but you can't really... But yeah, you really start to see this break at about 500 meters between a bioluminescence dominated environment and an ambient light dominated environment. Mm -hmm. And once you get, there's no real benefit to being ultra black in a, um, at least from a camouflage point of view yeah. in the ambient light dominated environment, it actually hurts you because it just makes you stick out like a sore thumb. Um, but it can, in some cases, at least in terrestrial we've seen, it probably is used for signaling. Um, so like the, the ultra black butterflies typically are using ultra black around other colors. And we're thinking, we're, we think we're, they're doing it to sort of maximize the signal contrast, um, you know, to make a really strong, strong presentation. You see it in some of these like tropical butterflies. Yeah. Um, and also because butterfly wings can, you know, under really bright light, get some, you know, sort of like glare off of them because, you know, they have pretty high refractive index being ultra black allows that contrast to be maintained under really direct sunlight under a lot of different orientations. So we think, yeah, there is like a signaling benefit. And we're actually doing experiments now to sort of mess around with that some, you know, terrestrial. But in the deep sea, we think it's all camouflage and that really starts showing up below about 500 meters. Interesting, okay. So, so given that, I mean, especially in the terrestrial environment where it all seems to be sex, like the birds of paradise and so on, um, mm -hmm. In the deep sea, you have a, an environmental gradient, and that begs the question of whether, for example, certain families or genera of fish are in some sense pre-adapted with their surface to become ultra black. Is there any, any his history that allows them to evolve being ultra black? And has any analyses a, ever been done? It's a really good question. Yeah, you know, we've done these sort of phylogenetic surveys of, you know, basically where are the really black fish and you know where are the really silvery fish, and so you know, looking at these different strategies and how much, you know, phylogeny play, plays a role versus environment. There are definitely groups that have really, you know, they're the ones where you see most of the ultra black animals. The biggies being um, the stomiids, um, which are called the dragonfish. Um, they're a group of fairly predatory, relatively lower mesopelagic fish. Um, and you see an awful lot of extremely black fish in that group. Um, the other group where you see an awful lot of these are the deep sea anglers. Um, you know, and again, that's probably because they're holding a lure up right in front of their body and the lure is not gonna work. Um, in fact, actually the, um, the new iteration of the um, camera system <clears throat> for um, the giant squid hunting, you know, we're going out on more trips, is actually now called the angler and we're making it ultra black. Um, because, you know, we do have this, you know, this fake bioluminescent lure in front of it. And the problem is that it's always lighting up the camera system itself. And we want to avoid that. And so we were inspired on the last cruise by these ultra black fish to basically make an ultra black camera system. Um, the same sort of thing. But those are the two groups that really seem to um, do it. Whether they have anything physiological or developmental that makes it easier for them to go down that route, um, it's a really good question. Um, it is different. Um, so, you know, in your average fish that's got dark skin, 
there is a relatively small number of melanophores and they're completely interspersed within a certain layer of the skin. Um, but with the ultra black ones, there's a whole separate layer that is essentially 100% um, melanin granules. Um, so they, you know, they switched in that way. Um, they probably also have to have some, some extra things on this. Some of them are covered in sort of like a light mucus that we think also acts as an anti-reflection coating, sort of like anti-reflection coatings on um, lenses and things like that. Um, so there are definitely some relatively big morphological differences aside from just tuning the size and shape of these particles. And yeah, there could be some groups, you know, maybe they have like basically a pre-adaptation for going that direction. Um, but if it is, it's in the stomi, it's in the um, anglerfish. So, and if, there's another question that's raised immediately also, and it came to mind because in the beginning you talked about um, certain fish uh, that attack bait balls uh, and that yeah. they keep on doing it. And there might be a million fish that can't do the bait ball in, but if there's a hundred fish, they certainly can. Um, mm -hmm. So in this case in the deep sea, you have some of these fish that either have a lure or they, uh, they have a, a flashlight. Mm -hmm. The prey, they're also ultra black. Am I right about that? Yeah, in general, it's the prey. Yeah, the prey and yeah, I mean, you get prey ultra black and predator ultra black, yeah. Right. So it, 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 it does beg the question of, of whether these two strategies are, have what real impact they have numerically on all the prey of fish. Because if mm -hmm. the prey, prey are all ultra black, it might be that that really by and large they're doing pretty well. Uh, and 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 they're avoiding predators. But of course, if they meet up with a dragonfish, uh, they're they have a real problem because they can't see it and they, it can see them. That's a terrible situation. But mm -hmm. but being ultra black must be a, a real good adaptation for many of the other predators in that sort of uh, depth. I'm wondering if anybody is really if it's really even possible. To make a, a you know to wreck to, to in some way even make make a numerical analysis of what how much predation goes on. Yeah, God, that it's hard. I mean, there are some. There's somebody we've been talking to. There's a, a trophic um, web person, um, Adam Scripps, Anella Choi. Um, you know, we've thought about. You know, we're sort of setting up a larger grant to look at some of these things. We've thought about you know bringing someone that like that. Um, I mean, like with everything deep sea, you know, large scale quantitative data is not always there. Um, so, you know, there are there are definitely studies of, you know, the gut contents of, you know, different predator, deep sea predators and so on. But even those are limited to like one or two investigators. So like Tracy Sutton has done a tremendous amount of like what's inside dragonfish guts, uh, but not many other people have outside of his lab. It's... um. You know, the deep sea is really fun. It's really interesting, but it can be frustrating to get, you know, these sort of baseline sort of things like you're talking about. Okay. But we sure like to. <laughs> <laughs> now, this issue of success strikes me as a really important question. Uh, if you were not very common, uh, not making a big impact on the prey population, I'd have a very different attitude as to what that strategy means. Mm -hmm. it's, well, it's the other thing, so, so, you know, mostly it's talking about the flashlights here, but the other thing to think about is that bioluminescence is in general a problem for all. Um, so, you know, bioluminescence is used, you know, as far as we can tell as a way to mark animals. Um, you know, if you're being preyed upon, sometimes, you know, some of these animals leave sacrificial bioluminescent tags on other animals. Sometimes they'll coat them with sticky bioluminescent mucus. Um, sometimes they'll just illuminate them. And so, you know, even aside from flashlights, which are sort of like the most direct way of thinking about it, um, because there's so little to look at, it seems like, by, like you'd think by, you know, if you went to the deep sea, you'd see bioluminescence all the time, but you don't. It's like everybody's kind of holding their breath because nobody wants to be the one to set off the light and be the one that's targeted. And nobody wants to be illuminated by someone else's light. Um, so there's just sort of a general selection for being relatively dark that, you know, these fish have really taken to an extreme. Yeah, then the numerical issue really matters. I mean, for example, the many of these, well, well certainly anglerfish are famous for having a gigantic uh, mouth, uh, which sounds like, you know, when they get a prey, they're going to 
they're going to try to eat it. Uh, and mm -hmm. but these some of these other fish also have really dramatic adaptations for opening wide. Oh yeah. <laughs> and and you wonder whether is that I, I have no idea because I don't know about deep sea fish, but I wonder if those those things which you see in textbooks really are typical of these deep sea predators. Well, there's a whole bunch of other predators that are slicking along and and like tarpon and getting things and doing pretty well. Yeah, and that's always been a real problem. Like I always say, you know, most oceanography, we mostly get to study the slow, the small, and the stupid um, <laughs> because they're the things that can get caught in nets and they're the things that won't run away from a submersible or other systems, which is one of the reasons why years ago, was me and Edie and Justin Marshall came up with the original plan for these stealth camera systems um, because <clears throat> we don't know what's going on. We don't know what's going on with the larger, smarter, you know, more visual animals down there because they stay away. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, the stuff that, you know, you typically pull up in a net, yeah, you get these small animals with these tremendous adaptations for holding on to prey once they get it. You know, these enormous mouths, these enormous teeth, um, you know, you get the feeling that they just sort of sit around like for a year waiting to finally get to bite something. Um, but we also know from the stealth camera footage that there are predators down there that operate very much like surface predators. Um, you know, things like grouper kind of fish, you know, just sort of roaming around taking things out. But we don't know as much about them because the normal sampling systems for the deep sea don't work well for that. Uh, could I ask you a question about UV absorbance? Sure. Thank you. Um, you know, when I was thinking of my question, it, it was something I read in an article a couple of years ago, and I just looked at the article and realized that they were actually interviewing you. Um, oh. <laughs> it's, just, <laughs> it's a New York Times Science Times article from 2014. Um, in the article, you mentioned uh, the transparent fish and how they can be vulnerable to UV damage from having their tissue be so transparent. So you said something like some of them have a kind of ultraviolet blocking coating to protect yeah. some of their internal organs. Mm -hmm. How does that work? Is it is it kind of like the melanin layers, but keyed to a different wavelength that they absorb, or is it something some different mechanism? And it's also yeah. inside the body. Yeah, it's an old study I did. Oh God, I mean, God, I published that like probably twenty years ago. Now it wasn't fish; it was looking at invertebrates. Um, um, it was at a time when people were looking at a lot at some of these um, more transparent UV absorbing compounds like MAAs. Um, it, I was interested in the trade off between, you know, remaining invisible and protecting yourself against UV damage if you lived in like the top 10 to 20 meters of the open ocean. So, you know, UV in coastal regions is absorbed extraordinarily quickly. I mean, nobody's going to worry about getting a sunburn even like a meter down if you go to the beach in North Carolina underwater. Um, but in the open ocean, it's amazing how slowly UV, UVA actually is attenuated. Water itself is much better at attenuating like orange and red and all that than it is in UV. Um, so we're sort of interested in this balance between the two, especially for animals that are out there like doing UV predation, because there are a fair number of animals out there that can see in the UV. Um, and we never got much, we actually wrote some grants and nobody ever funded it. So we stopped that particular part. I had a postdoc who was very interested in it and it didn't work um, to get funded for it. But yeah, we, what we got to was that if you do measurements of the transparency of you know, these shallow water transparent animals compared to ones that were just a, you know, somewhat deeper where there was definitely no UV, um, the ones in the shallow had the sharp drop off in transparency once you got into the UV. And so, you know, it looked like they had some sort of, you know, protecting compounds, maybe something like an MAA or something like that that was transparent and visible. And then we did some modeling of how that would affect UV vision versus protection and so on. Um, yeah, it was a long time ago. Um, there are some weird things about UV in the deep, like there are animals that can see UV that live very deep. Um, there are a number of crustaceans with visual pigments that peak right in the near UV. Um, that we just don't understand. Tammy Frank at um, Nova Southeastern has done most of the work on this. Um, yeah, and it's a group of different um, oplophorid shrimp and a number of different um, benthic crabs. And we have no idea what's up with that. We've developed different hypotheses, but there is no UV down there. Um, you know, by the time you get to that depth, there's nothing left. I and mean, we're talking hundreds of meters down. 
Uh, but nevertheless, they're sensitive to it. And, you know, some of them are benthic. It's not like they're vertically migrating. Um, and we've had some thoughts, but it's really a puzzler. Could that be some vestige of when they lived at a lower depth or had those things been down there for a while? Um, yeah, and that gets into the whole, like, actually putting a clock on the evolutionary history of the colonization of the deep sea, which has been tricky. Um, you know, the general idea is that, you know, the deep sea was colonized from the shallow world. Um, but how recent that was for different groups isn't that well understood um, since sort of the whole genomic field for ocean oceanic animals still isn't that old. Um, I mean, one of the people who started doing phylogenies of oceanic um, one of the original people doing, you know, molecular phylogenies of oceanic animals was Ken Halanich, which was, oh my God, only about 20 years ago or 25 years ago. So that one's a really hard question to answer, but that would be a long time to retain a pigment. Our idea was that even though the peak is sitting in sort of over in the border of the UV, that the tail, the you know, UV, basically any visual pigment tends to be very broad in its sensitivity that it's the tail that goes into the visible is allowing them to have really good color discrimination in the blue. So for example, our color discrimination in the blue is terrible. Um, you know, one blue looks like another blue to us. We don't think it's terrible because what are we gonna compare it to? But animals that have cones that are very close to each other in the blue part of the spectrum are probably much better able to distinguish all these shuttle, subtle shades of blue which in the deep sea really matters because different bioluminescences are different shades of blue um, that they could be able to maybe pick out, you know, a conspecific signal from a heterospecific or to separate out certain sorts of bioluminescent camouflage and so on. So that was one idea, but we don't know. Um, it's a puzzler. Thank you. Sure. Can I just ask one follow-up question about the ultraviolet? You were describing invertebrates doing this. Have you seen anything with fish that had to protect themselves from, ultra, from UV damage? I haven't done it myself. I mean, you want to be looking at- Personally, you know, I like arthropods more anyway, so I'm, I'm happy with <laughs> that. I'll, yeah. I'll tell you right now. Yeah, well, I mean, there are transparent fish. Most of them are larval. Um, so the ones that might be interesting are some of the freshwater transparent fish that are extraordinarily transparent. Um, that could actually be measured and worked on like a great one, you know, like the glass catfish, like Asian glass catfish, like Cryptoterrace. Um, you know, they're beautifully, beautifully clear. I mean, you could read a book through them. We use them for a couple of morphological studies. Um, they may actually have some sort of protective thing. Um, you know, they do like fairly vegetated water. And so maybe that you know, they're using that as the blocker. But, you know, if I were going to guess for an animal to try it out, that'd be a good one. Um, but then there are also these, um, like the super surface dwelling, sometimes very clear fish, like some, I guess they're called the atherinids or something. There's a number of these different, very close to the surface fish, which when they're small are pretty transparent. When they're larger, they tend to be you know, quite mirrored. Um, but the really small ones, um, they may actually have to have protection because some of them literally sit like millimeters from the surface. Um, you know, they're just right up against the top. Um, so if I were going to guess, they might have something pretty interesting going on because they're getting no, you know, UV absorption from the water at all. Um, so they must be doing something and some are quite clear. Thank you. Sure. I do have lots of questions, but I'll try to control myself until you are <laughs> done. You mentioned MAH compounds. What is that? Is that oh, what MAA? You're... Was it mycosporine like amino acids? There was a, a period in, a, especially in the 90s, where a lot of people were looking at, I mean, because, you know, because of the ozone hole, um, and I'm no expert on the ozone hole by any stretch, so don't hold me to all of it, but there's a period where there's a lot of research done on UV absorbing compounds, um, some of which were transparent, um, because they're interested in, you know, UV damage, you know, it, in the Southern Ocean. But yeah, they're called mycosporin-like amino acids. Um, but we never did an assay on those particular invertebrates to see if you know that that's what they were sequestering, you know, to give them their low. Um, that's one of the things we were going to do. Uh, but then you know we didn't get funded for that, so we ended up working on different projects.
So you did mention this issue of eye size. And I'm wondering yeah. if you have any opinions about this uh, debate that has occurred about the size of, of eyes of, uh, of squids. Being oh, yeah, cool. yeah, because yeah, we, we had a fun thing back and forth with, um, I guess it was the yeah, Lars Schmitz and that whole group. Yeah, because I wrote a paper with uh, was Don Eric Nilsson and um, Eric Warren. We were looking, we originally wanted to put together a model for how far you could see something underwater depending on the actual water and the size of the eye and the visual physiology and all that. And we used giant squid as sort of our case example um, because you know they have these ridiculously large eyes. Um, and then there was a rebuttal from Lars Schmidt and some other folks saying that if you extrapolated out the eye sizes of squid that were much smaller, you would get to the eye size of a giant squid. Um, and then our rebuttal to that was that it was a, a really extreme um, extrapolation um, with extremely large error bars that basically to not fall within that range, the eye size for the giant squid could vary by, I think it was 220 fold in volume. Um, so that, yeah, it didn't, using their data, it wouldn't show up as significantly outside the bounds of, you know, continuing, you know, scaling relationship that you saw for the smaller ones but that this was an extremely easy test to pass um, because of, you know, you're taking a bunch of small squid and creating a, a allometric relationship and then extrapolating out by a couple orders of magnitude. Um, so yeah, that was sort of the argument back and forth. Um, it is true that in general, if you look at animals, there's a, a negative relative size scaling relationship with increasing size. So that as animals get larger, their eyes become smaller relative to their body. Um, so you look at something like a whale, which of course is incredibly huge in terms of mass, its eye maxes out at a few inches across, um, which is much more typical that you get this um, negative allometry. Um, and it may be as simple as that squid just over their entire range, and maybe we can fill in the entire range at some point with extant, extant and extinct tax on all that, that they just have a one-to-one, -one, you know, scaling relationship. Um, that doesn't change the fact that a really large eye only serves certain purposes um, and that's good for some things and really doesn't give you much advantage for others. Um, the original paper we wrote, we were really interested in what can you really gain if you make your eye bigger than a few inches across? It turns out you only gain in a few select areas. Um, for most animals, having an eye bigger than a few inches across is worthless. Um, it's a real diminishing return argument. Uh -huh. So that was sort of the back and forth. Um, yeah, and it, we are actually, there. we're basically friends on both sides. So was, I guess we would call it one of these like friendly debates. Um, one of the people actually on that paper was, uh, he was an undergrad in my lab, uh, he was a good friend of mine. So we had a good time arguing it out at meetings. My impression is in, in, in these extrapolation models, generally people don't have good functional models mm. for a, a, a structure that gets has some on some exponent. The only one I've ever seen that's really well done is with deer, with antlers. Mm. Uh, but, but in many other cases, you, you know that things are on a straight line um, and a large thing is proportionally larger and so on. But, but you don't really have a model for why that should be so in, in the first place. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, of course, some of these things have led to endless arguments like the endless three quarter metabolic scaling law. Um, you know, some of my friends are involved in that one and they're endlessly battling over who has the explanation for for that and whether that law actually really holds, you know, in the first place. Yeah, I, I've never actually done much in scaling. Um, but yeah, it, there are a lot of battles in that world. I'm listening. Anybody else have any questions? I have a, a kind of a simple follow-up to what you were just talking about with the squid eyes. And I'm yeah. not sure if I, I understood all of that, but my, my really simple question, which probably doesn't have a simple answer, why do giant squids have such gigantic eyes? I, I read something about perceiving the bioluminescent smear all over something the size of a sperm whale that they could see it. 
Yeah, that was that paper. Captured that much light. Well, that's the thing is it's not that much light, which is what, so, so I guess the first question is what does a big eye really get you? You know, if you make an eye bigger and bigger, what does it get you? Um, in theory, it, it can do two things. Um, one, it could, in theory, give you enormously high acuity. You know, you could put in more and more photoreceptors and each of those photoreceptors would be looking at an even smaller piece of visual space. You know, it'd be kind of like making the world's biggest camera chip. Um, but the reality of that is that there's no brain capable of parsing that much information. The real limit on visual acuity isn't just like the size of the eye, but the size of the cognitive power to do something with that information. Um, having a really huge eye and having enormous amounts of, and using it just for acuity can become pointless. Um, if you can't, it's like, like once described, it's like having a television set on or a hundred television sets on, but nobody's watching. Um, the other thing you can do with a really big eye is make it more sensitive. Um, you can have, instead of, you know, looking at each photoreceptor independently and having enormous acuity, you could tie them together, which is what we do with our rods. So at night, each one of our pixels, if you want to call it that inside our eye is actually 90 rods tied together to make one big pixel. And so what does that do? Um, one, it makes just you more sensitive to light overall. You can see under dimmer light. But the bigger one is that it makes your what's called signal to noise much better. In other words, you're able to distinguish smaller gradations in brightness and tell them apart. Um, you know, the more light you get in, sort of the more shades of gray you can see, I guess, is the way to think about it. Um, and so, and, and you need to have an extremely good ability to do that to see any length underwater um, because water is really good at taking all the contrast out of an image. You know, if you're, if you're like a scuba diver, I don't know if you are, um, your fellow scuba diver will fade from view long before they're too small to see. Um, you know, they'll just sort of fade in the background water because you don't have the ability to see that really low contrast as they move away from you. And so having a really big eye allows you to see really, really low amounts of contrast, which allows you to see very far in the water. But the only reason to see really far in the water is you have to be able to see something that's actually biologically relevant to you, um, which is why we thought, you know, it made some sense with the giant squid and the sperm whale, because the sperm whale could in theory actually make use of the information that something very large was there. If you're, let's say a shrimp, having information about an approaching baleen whale coming your way, or let's say if you're a krill and a baleen whale is coming, serves you no purpose. Um, so it sort of fit together. Now, of course, we haven't like taken a giant squid and a sperm whale and put them together and you know see everything that's going on. That'd be quite the experiment. Um, but the one other place where you do see absolutely enormous eyes is the one or the case where very, very large animals were interacting with each other, likely over pretty long distances underwater, um, which were um, the, basically the pelagic dinosaurs. Um, they have some you know, truly impressive eye sizes. Um, that paper gets into all of it. Like I think the ichthyosaurs, the they had really big eyes, right? Yeah, they have really like just that. really impressive eyes. If you ever go to like the British Museum, they have this amazing wall of um, ichthyosaurs and they show you know, you know, those big eyes because they had those giant um, plates around the eyes these sort of neat radial bony plates and um, you can really get a sense of how impressive those eyes were. Um, and that is a case where you have large animals interacting with each other in water, um, you know, visually over distances. So, you know, it fit, is it true? We don't know because, you know, again, <laughs> running an experiment would essentially be impossible. Um, so we're left with, and that's actually an awful lot of deep sea biology is like that. I like to call it forensic biology because you know, you're gathering evidence, you're making inferences, you're running models, but a lot of times you never actually get to see the animals do the thing that you think they might be doing. You never get to do like what you do, like let's say if you wanna understand beaver behavior and put a little GoPro inside a beaver lodge and get first-hand information about everything you're guessing, um, which makes it you know, a really frustrating field. Um, and one of the reasons why it's only part of what we do um, because it can be so frustrating from that point of view. 
So we have other systems that are much more tractable to experimental manipulation and things like that. Is it possible that uh, being uh, fixated on predators and prey with a giant squid might be putting you on the wrong track? Maybe there's some sex involved. It's and, possible. And if that's uh, um, the case, then you can work on uh, eyes of uh, shallow water squid and, 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 and the interaction and the perception, because we know that that squid and cuttlefish do use their eyes to detect surface patterns um, and that, that's involved in mating. So oh, yeah. there's something going on there. Yeah, it could very well be. And, um, and we know that, you know, you know, I mean, most cephalopods I know, you know, find a way to actually meet and copulate. It's actually been one of the funny puzzles in our head because there's this enormously transparent octopus. It's beautifully clear. I mean, you just can't see this thing. But we have video footage of them finding each other and copulating. We have no idea how they do it. Um, yeah, and I mean, of course, yes, yeah, smaller cephalopods are famous for, you know, really complicated sexual interactions. Um, so it could very well be. It could be they're finding each other. As far as we know, giant squid themselves don't bioluminesce, um, which is unusual. I mean, you know, so many deep sea cephalopods do. Right. Um, but that's, of course, you know, we're dealing we could be completely wrong um, because nobody's ever been able to examine any tissue in good shape. And, you know, it's a very big squid to go over to find a photo for. But, um, but yeah, no, it could very well be interest specific. You're totally right. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sensing that we're beginning to tail off with questions. So may maybe I'll just ask a general question. I wonder if you could spend a couple of minutes telling us, uh, which I think we'd all be interested in, in your, your, uh, your participation in, in this hunt for the giant squid. It's kind of a cool story. And if okay, you yeah. So, yeah, like I said, it was about 15, 16 years ago, um, you know, me and Edie and um, uh, another ocean scientist, Justin Marshall um, over in Australia, we're on a cruise. We've been on a lot of cruises together by that point. We're just sitting around a table in the mess hall on the ship talking about like, how can we get footage of things that don't like lights, you know, don't like noise, you know, always, and have the ability to get away. You know, we were tired of always just catching tiny little shrimp or whatever. And so we started thinking about, you know, can we make a stealth camera system? So the original one was a benthic model. It was called the eye in the sea. It was built on a shoestring. Um, I mean, we would cannibalize parts from the ship to put it together on the fly. It broke down all the time. But one of the very first um, times it was deployed, it found a two meter long mantle length squid that was new to science um, attacking, you know, this, this jelly lure. So we were impressed. Um, and then Edie got some money to build um, a, a pelagic version. Well, it also worked benthically, but it was nicer. It had floats and it looked more professional. That was built by a, an amazing deep sea engineer named Lee Fry. He's been actually building all these. He's extremely good. We're working with him actually now on this, these new ones. Um, and so then last year, we had a cruise to do a number of different optical things. I was the chief scientist on it and Edie was on it. And we did the deployments, the pelagic deployments of this camera, which were a mix of high tech and very low tech. So the camera, there was a ball at the surface, a big red ball, like, you know, like a buoy fender. Um, and then we had a mile of yellow rope, just straight up rope. Um, and then the camera hanging from it with the, this LED flashing thing in front of it that looked like the pager in a restaurant. Like if you went to like a cheesecake factory and you were waiting for your table. And that's pretty much it. It's basically a camera on a string. And we had to lower it and raise it by hand, um, which was a bear because the whole thing together with the batteries weighed about hundred pounds. And so every day, you know, we'd, pay this thing out you know we throw it in the water and pay up and that took about an hour and then every next day we would literally heave it in like we we're on the challenger expedition in like the 19th century um because there was no other way to do it and we would just we did everything but sing songs i mean you know there are about five of us out there we're telling jokes whatever just continually like pulling this thing in and then we download all the video and look at it and we had an ROV group on there, you know, with their own remote sub. And they told us, cause we're in the area where all the oil rigs are. And they said that there was probably, I don't know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of hours of footage because of all the recorded footage of them repairing oil rigs, right? 
Um, so they just keep the cameras on all the time while they're fixing everything. They said they've never seen anything. They've never seen a giant squid this and that. And they said, well, you know, maybe you had to turn out the lights. Um, and we'd only done five deployments. And on the fifth one, you know, I'm on the bridge, like deciding where to go next. And he all of a sudden runs to the bottom of the stairs and says, we got it. I'm like, oh my God. Um, and so we go down, we look at the footage and it, we think it's the right squid and it's really impressive. And then I kid you not, 15 minutes later, lightning hit the ship um, and took out all the computers in the top of the ship. It hit the, the um, antenna on the bridge, took out everything up there. And we thought it was gonna destroy the computer that had our footage. Um, and luckily it didn't. We sort of we were like, oh my God, you know, first we're like, holy crap, we just been hit with lightning. And then we're like, oh my God, you know, we just destroyed the footage and nobody believed we ever got it. We saved that. And then nobody believed us. It was my job as the chief scientist to contact the press on the ship and say, you know, we had this footage, would they like to, you know, maybe do a story on it? And I wrote all these places and nobody wrote me back because they thought we were pranks. Um, and so finally I went through a friend of mine who's an author and she had the personal email address of the science editor of the New York Times. And I basically just wrote him, I said, you know, this is, I mean, I, it was the only time I ever wrote a letter and I said, this is not a hoax. Um, you know, I said, you know, we have footage of a giant squid, you know, right next to an oil rig, right off the coast, lightning hit the ship, all this crazy stuff. And they actually wrote us back. And then, yeah, we had to very slowly move all the footage and everything over because we had a terrible internet link because we're in the middle of the ocean. And then, yeah, within about a day, it was covered by, I don't know, 250 news outlets all over the planet um, and became, yeah, a pretty huge story. Um, so it was crazy. Um, it was one of the nuttier things we ever did. And so now, yeah, we've gotten money from, um, I guess it's Netflix, BBC, and Ocean X to go out on some other cruises on ships with these newly designed um, camera systems that Lee Fry is building actually, well, right now. We're supposed to have a meeting in a day or two to go over the progress of the systems. I hope you have one of, uh, one of these IMAX equivalent uh, movie cameras this time. So yeah, we're going for it, but yeah. Good. Yeah, that's one thing. We're getting a better camera, a uh, better camouflage, um, a couple other improvements. Yeah, the nice thing is, you know, we've got more money. Everything else has always been done on a shoestring. Um, so it's nice that it works. So there's more money to put it all together in a good way and to build more of them because, you know, the more things you have floating around out there, the more chance you have of seeing stuff. Um, Fabulous. So we're trying to build about five of them. Fantastic. Well, I think uh, if, if nobody has any objection, maybe we'll draw things to a, a close. This has really been a fascinating talk and discussion and uh, really wonderful. So, yeah, well, thanks for having me. Thanks very much for coming here. So yeah. somebody's waving. Connor, hey, you have one last question? Sorry, I know I, I didn't know I was muted. I was just waving to say thank you so much. Oh, oh okay. okay, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me join in on that. Thank you very much. So let's say goodbye to everybody. And uh, I really was happy that you came and uh, it's a wonderful talk and uh, a lot of other things we can think about. So thanks very much. Yeah, well, great. Take care all, enjoy the sunny weather up there. <laughs> the sun is still shining, kind of. Getting cloudy <laughs> again. <laughs> okay, Alrighty. thanks very much. All righty. Okay, cheerio. Bye. Bye.